My name is Kevin Griffin. I live down in the Norfolk area and drove up for the day to chat with you fine folks. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP. My specialty is in ASP.NET. I've been working with it for an extremely long time, probably going on about 10 years now. Uh, I've worked with every major version of ASP.NET up and through the, the current latest version. Uh, I own a company called SwiftKick. We specialize in software training and consulting services. And so if you ever find yourself in need for any of those, uh, feel free to give us a call. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I spend a lot of time on Twitter, at OneKevGriff. And if you ever have any questions afterwards, so maybe you see something tonight, sp spark something in your mind and you want to follow up with me later, feel free to email me, uh, Kevin at SwiftKick.in. Uh, also, part of SwiftKick, we do a bi-weekly webinar series. Uh, actually did one today uh, before for coming over here. It's just kind of our way of giving back to the community by bringing really smart people on to talk about what they're passionate about. Uh, but if you go to go swiftkick.in slash show, uh, you can put your email address in and we'll tell you when the next um, SwiftKick shows come up. And we have a couple good ones in the, in the lineup. All right, so the, I've done this talk over the past year or so and every time I've done the talk, it's been a little bit different than the time before, especially when I got started doing this talk because Signal R for ASP.NET Core was in a preview release mode, which means they could break anything that they wanted to. And they did as often as they could. And we decided um, for a couple of our projects to adopt .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, and we had to use SignalR in its very early preview release, and everything broke, and I have a lot of experience using broken SignalR in production uh, with some of our larger clients, uh, but we're finally at a 1.0 release of, of, of uh, SignalR for ASP.NET Core. And that's the official name too, SignalR for ASP.NET Core 2.0. If I say just SignalR core, that's not official, but that's what I mean. Okay, uh, has anyone used SignalR before in older versions of .NET? I've done a technology in uh, any push application, but just for fun. Just for fun? Okay, well that's how most people react. SignalR is this great part of ASP.NET that no one ever uses. <laughs> uh, and so let me do a little bit of history. If we go back to the late 2000s, so around 2009, 2010, uh, the internet, the web standards were rapidly evolving. Um, and if you were a developer back then, which I assume most of you here probably were, uh, you, it was very difficult to be a web developer at the time because everything was always changing. And we ended up targeting much older browsers specifically because if you targeted a new browser, it would change day after day after day. And one of the big parts of this changing, evolving standard was a technology called WebSockets, which you, I'm hoping everyone in here has heard of WebSockets uh, in some way, shape, or form. But back in, let's say 2009, WebSockets was still like bleeding edge technology. I remember going to a conference in Vegas called Mix. It was the, it was a Microsoft conference that dealt with web, uh, web standards and web technologies. It was fantastic. It was one of my favorite conferences I've ever been to. And I remember going to a session on WebSockets where the gentleman doing the talk was showing us how WebSockets worked from an implementation standpoint and then had to say, you can only ever run this code on the night on the nightly builds of Chrome because it's the only build that supports this. And he went to show us the demo, and the demo wouldn't work. Well, it turns out that the night before they reverted and took WebSockets out of the nightly builds because they broke something. Um, and then the next couple of days they put it back in. So he showed us an alternative that would implement WebSockets using a uh, Flash plugin, <laughs> if you remember Flash plugins. So it was a very dirty way of implementing WebSockets. 
And every developer out there who is working on production software just went, no. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to do this or use this technology in my applications because it's too hard to implement for Chrome, but then also have to support IE, um, Safari, Firefox, and all, all that good stuff. So Signal R came around, and then it was a little bit later. WebSockets was more fully supported, but you still had this problem where only newer generation browsers supported WebSockets. So the Chrome I downloaded off the internet, um, if I kept it up to date, it had WebSockets in it. Firefox had WebSockets in it. Uh, Internet Explorer 10 had WebSockets in it. We, we were fine, but not everyone was running one of those three browsers. Folks were still on older versions of IE, and some folks still are. <laughs> Uh, you might have been using an older version of Firefox or older version of Chrome or even older versions of Safari. Mobile browsers didn't fully support WebSockets. So if you were coming in trying to build a solution around WebSockets, you also had to support other ways of, of implementing the same features for older browsers, which there are, there are various ways to do that, which I'll talk about a little bit. If you're a .NET developer and you're just not wanting to write any of that code, Signal R was a dream come true. So in 2013, the ASP.NET team recognizing that they wanted to push WebSockets forward, but developers didn't want to write two or three or four implementations of real-time web communication. They developed Signal R specifically to abstract the, uh, the protocols. So I could write code one way, and SignalR would determine whether or not the connection should be done with WebSockets, if it should be done with uh, server send events or forever frame or long polling. Just all these different ways for a server and a client to talk to each other. So it was great. I write code once and it just works whichever way is most efficient for the situation. Uh, it only worked in ASP.NET full framework. So everything up to ASP.NET 4. Well, what, 4.7 now, which is the current full framework ASP.NET. But if we were on .NET Core, things were not that fun. The, so .NET Core got released, everyone went, oh, this is awesome, 1.0 kind of sucked. Uh, we waited for 1.5 and eventually .NET Core 2.0 came out. Uh, and when .NET Core 2 came out, everyone really jumped on that bandwagon. It was fantastic, still is fantastic. But Signal R did not work with Core because several of the underlying parts that made Signal R do what Signal R did uh, weren't supported in Core. So this is kind of a lesson of how well you understand the differences between .NET Core, the .NET standard, and .NET Full Framework. Uh, .NET Full Framework is this kitchen sink of every possible thing that .NET can do, and .NET Core is just a small list of things that .NET should be able to do, but it can do it across multiple platforms. So if the .NET standard says, um, we support sockets, well, that means we support sockets on Windows, Linux, Mac, Docker, so on. Uh, .NET Full Framework can't make those same promises. So critical parts that were required for SignalR did not exist in the .NET standard. That made, so it made it very difficult, nay, impossible to support SignalR. The team, the ASP.NET team, recognized that there was no legitimate way they were gonna have a version of Signal R ready to go uh, for core uh, in a decent um, amount of time. So they hacked together a version because that's what developers do, right? We just hack it till it works. So sometime after .NET Core 1.5 was released, we got a hacked version of Signal R that wasn't full featured, did 70% of what the full version of Signal R did, but it was good enough for us. <laughs> and I actually put the hacked version of Signal R into production for at least three clients because it did enough, it did enough well, and it wasn't crashing on us. Uh, and it wasn't until September 14th last year that the official first alpha release of Signal R for ASP.NET Core was released. And I'll tell you what, we moved from the hacked version to the official alpha release and more stuff broke. The, re the alpha was more broken than the hacked version of the uh, old bits. 
over time, over time, over time, things got better, APIs changed, more things broke, some stuff got fixed, and eventually got to a couple months ago where the 1.0 release of SignalR for ASP.NET Core, or SignalR Core, um, was released. And there was much, much rejoicing. So, not really any hands went up when I asked uh, anyone who has used SignalR in the past, and I've learned from experience of doing this talk multiple times, I should just do a demo of a basic SignalR application, walk through the bits of it, and I think you can see everything click. So I can't really tell you what's different in the old version versus the new version uh, without showing you how everything works. So let's jump in to a very, very basic uh, application. All right, let me, let me come in here. Uh, this is a very simple uh, ASP.NET Core application. Um, how many folks are working with the ASP.NET Core or .NET Core in general? Okay, so the structure of the application shouldn't be that much different. Uh, we have our dub dub group that's all of our public files that we're exposing to the internet. Uh, for my cases, I just put everything in there that's client side. Uh, normally you wouldn't do that. We have our program CS, that's our main, our entry point. And we have our startup CS is how we bootstrap uh, an ASP.NET application. So if I open Program CS and Startup, walk through these files real fast. Program's pretty simple. Let's create a web host, let's, uh, let's build it, and let's run it. This is standard across every ASP.NET Core app. In Startup, we have two methods, and both of these methods get executed when an ASP.NET Core application executes. Uh, first is configure services, and this is where we set up our dependency injection. By default, we have an ASP.NET Core app that doesn't know how to do anything. We have to tell it what it should know how to do, and because ASP.NET Core is fully uh, backed by in injected dependencies, we have to set up those injections. So this is where all that stuff happens. Uh, if I was writing a ASP.NET MVC application, this is where I would come say, well, let's inject MVC. So now the application knows how to do ASP.NET MVC stuff. But we're not going to do that. We're going to keep all the request pipeline. When a request comes into our web server, what should it do? Um, so we tell it, if we're in development mode, we should support a developer exception page or the yellow screen or have um, frowning face of death. Uh, we should support default files and static files. That sets up our www root. And if uh, the browser doesn't ask for anything, we give them index.html by default. Just really simple stuff here. We're going to go in and we're going to configure this to use SignalR in a moment. But let me jump into the client side. On the client, I have a very basic uh, web page, nothing special. There's going to be a text box with a button that says send, and then an unordered list uh, that I call messages. If I just go view this in the browser, view in browser, yep, yep, do that anyway. It doesn't look very special. Here's what we'd like to have happen. This is my new awesome chat application we're, we're working on. If I type in something into the box and I hit send, what I wanted to do is take that message and broadcast it to any person who is currently looking at this page on their machine. Right now it doesn't do that. Right now it just sits here and stares at me. Doesn't do a dang thing. So let's go set up those pieces as few lines of code as possible. All right. uh, I also have a TypeScript file over here that has a whole bunch of do-dos in it, so we know that work needs to get done. We just haven't done the work yet. This, is, this looks a lot like my production code, too. Right. So step one, you have to add the NuGet dependency for SignalR. I assume everyone in here is comfortable with NuGet, has used it in the past. I'm going to type in signal R. 
we have a lot of options for packages. And you might say, oh look, Microsoft ASP.NET uh, SignalR. That is the wrong one to install. That is the older version of SignalR. Uh, the one we want is Microsoft ASP.NET Core SignalR, which is that guy right there. I'll hit install. Now the latest version is 1.0.3. They've been making uh, incremental changes to it, but nothing breaking. Install all of its dependencies. All right, my restore is complete. Okay. Now to get started, I. To really show you something working and have to write both the client side and the server side, it's easier to start with the server because why not? The first thing we have to do is tell our ASP.NET application about SignalR. We have to inject all the specific uh, SignalR dependencies. And that's done very simply with add SignalR. We're telling ASP.NET Here's everything you need to know about SignalR implementation. Go. So we add our dependencies for SignalR. And then down here at the bottom, I'll tell my application to use SignalR. And this takes a, what's called a hub builder. Now a SignalR hub uh, is a connection point between a URL something that you would type in the browser, uh, to what we call a hub in, in our code or a class. Think of a hub in the same way you would think of an MVC controller. So if you've done MVC in the past, you know a controller is a central location for, uh, 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 for logic. So if I have an account controller, all my account related actions go in the account controller. Mm -hmm. If I have a user's controller, all a user maybe management goes in the user's controller. Uh, so where we're looking at hubs, we're going to work with hubs the same way. I'll have a chat hub that will handle all chat related uh, methods and actions. It, I have some, um, some applications where we have a member or user management hub and that's used by some of our administrators to quickly administrate users in the system or kick users off the system. Uh, but to set this up, you have to tell SignalR, I like to map what I'm gonna call a chat hub, and I haven't built this class yet, to a URL, and we'll just say slash chat hub. And I'm gonna go create that method that uh, class real fast. New folder. There's no convention here. Uh, I'm creating a folder called hubs, but you can call it anything you want to. You can put your hubs in a whole different assembly. That part doesn't matter. What does matter is the class. I'll call this class chat hub. And my chat hub is going to implement hub. This is part of SignalR. And there's no implementation that you have to do. It's just once you have a hub, you have a hub. And this part should automatically correct itself. So that's good. What this tells SignalR is that if I ever ask for, uh, through WebSockets or through any other means, uh, we'll say local, localhost 5000 slash chat hub, those connections should get routed to this chat hub. Now there's so much stuff that ha happens underneath the scenes, that's abstracted away from you. You don't have to worry about it unless you want to. Now inside my chat hub, I want to create a method to accept, oh, I already closed the browser to accept the input from that text box. 
and then rebroadcast it out to anyone who is listening. So I'll say public async task because everything's asynchronous in Signal R. I'll call a method broadcast message. No convention, that's just what I want to call it. I can call it anything I want to. And so what we'll say is when the web page is loaded, someone types something in the box, hit send. Whatever code runs in send will send it through SignalR up to our server and say execute this method, broadcast message, pass in whatever that message is, and then we want to resend that out to everyone else who's connected. Now, how do we know who's connected to our server? Because we implement hub, I get this fancy object called clients, and clients represents every connected client to my server. Uh, specifically, every connected client to this hub. Uh, you can have hubs that people don't connect to. Maybe I have an administrator hub. Only administrators should connect to administrator hub. So maybe not everyone's connected. Uh, so clients, I have the option of filtering this down a little bit more. If every browser, every tab, every person has a connection here, I might not want to send my message to everyone. So how do I filter that down? Uh, all seems pretty self-explanatory. Let's send the message to all connected clients. Caller means let's send the message to whomever made the original call. So let's say, uh, I have the browser open. Um, sir, what's your name? Adam. Adam, all right, Adam, you have a browser open. I type something in the box and hit send. It goes up to the server. Caller means send something back to me because I'm the originator of the, of the message. Uh, others means everyone, everyone else. Everyone except me. Um, so if I send the message up and say others, it will just go to Adam and anyone else who's connected. Now we can filter this down more. I can send it to very specific clients. Every connection to SignalR has a connection ID, and I can filter by specific connection IDs. I can say, all right, well, send it to everyone except a collection of connection IDs, uh, so on, so on. Uh, these don't get used very often, and technically the ASP.NET team says don't use clients, all except or clients, because these rely uh, on too granular of a uh, connection or too specific of a connection. And there are use cases where I could say, send to connection IDs one, two, and three, and they might not get it because of how some of the inner workings of similar work, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. What they do want you to use are groups. So I can group connections uh, into better named um, collections. So I have a group for the sales group or a group for administrators or a group that's currently looking at record one, two, three in, in the application. I, so we can go down and list more. I can send to specific users. If I know a person's user principle and I'm using ASP.NET identity, I can use a user principle to, to send a message. Uh, but long story short, Yes, sir. So can we use it to an Active Directory group? Yep, yeah, because you have a user principle. Uh, with Active Directory, you have user principles. You can send to a user principle. That's spotty sometimes. Just, and it's not because of Active Directory, it's because of SignalR trying to find a very specific person in a haystack of users. Yeah. Um, I, they still sometimes recommend groups over that, but it's one of those that's kind of an edge case. Not very many people are doing, uh, sending message, messages to AD principles. Uh, I've, had, I've had issues with it using just regular ASP.NET identity principles. But it's something you can do, <laughs> it's, it's built in, but we try to avoid it if we can. All right, so I can filter users down more. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna send it to all users and I'm going to tell SignalR to send a message 
asynchronously to all connected clients. And that, and I'm not telling it to send a message, I'm telling it to execute a method on all these clients. And I'm gonna call it write message. And I can pass in arguments. And you see here I have arg1, arg2, arg3, arg4, uh, so on. I'm just gonna pass message as arg1 and it's yelling at me because I'm not sending it, I'm not awaiting it. So I wait my call, cool. I'm done writing C-sharp. There should be no nothing else here. I'm gonna set a break point so we can come back to this in a minute. But message comes in, let's go to all clients and send them the command write message, just passing the, the original parameter in. Go, magic will happen. All right, let's go over here to our FTS. This is where the real magic is. All right. Sorry, I have my notes here because there's, there's a lot to remember. Uh, step one is I have to bring in SignalR. Now notice this is in TypeScript. You can use vanilla JavaScript or ES6, whatever you're most comfortable using or whatever your team is using. Um, the reason I use TypeScript is because that's one of the new features. They've dropped jQuery support in, or jQuery dependency in the new version of SignalR, but it's also all built in TypeScript which is, it, it's nice from a usability standpoint. Uh, if you were at a command prompt, you would do npm install slash s asp.net slash signal r, and that would go get the bits that you need for, for building. Now, I'm using Webpack to build everything to run through my TypeScript compiler. If you're not doing that, that's okay. Because I can go into Explorer. I've already pulled it down because it's a big name file. Um, if you go to what it downloads, you have this distribution folder. And I can say, just give me the pre-compiled version of SignalR. So just grab the JS file or the, the min.js file and you're, you're good to go. You don't have to go through all this TypeScript or ES6. Um, or Webpack or Gulf Grunt, all that crap. You can just use SignalR. But the, it's not cool to do that anymore. You have to make things more complicated than they really should be. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, in TypeScript, I'm going to import uh, SignalR from my package, ASP.NET SignalR. And that brings everything in under this SignalR moniker that I can use a little bit later. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to create the connection. And a connection in SignalR is, uh, is multi, does multiple things. So I'm going to create a new SignalR hub connection builder. And this hub builder is a fluent uh, interface where we, we can give it a set of options. So the first option I have to tell is, what URL do I need to connect to? Now remember this is my chat hub, and my URL for my chat hub was slash chat hub. And I wanna tell it to turn on logging, just because it's fun to see things working in the console. Oops, that's not how that was supposed to work. All right. And I want to tell it to build the hub connection. All right, that's a whole lot of work, uh, but this creates a connection in the background and hasn't done anything yet. The next step is to set to start my connection. So if I say connection.start, this goes out, it does negotiation with the, the server. So I talked before, uh, the big selling point for SignalR was that you could write the interface once and it would use WebSockets if WebSockets was best. It would use server send events or forever frame or long polling, depending on what the best connection protocol was for your client and for your server. Uh, that's what Stark does. Stark does all that negotiation for you. Oops. Now this is also a promise. It happens asynchronously. You don't know when it's eventually going to figure out what the right way to go is. 
So because it's a promise, I can set up event handlers when the promise returns, uh, successful or as a failure. I'm just gonna set up a quick response here for connected. My logger will tell me I'm connected as well, but that's all right. Um, I'm gonna wait on these other to-dos for a minute because this should compile now. All right, that's the building. If I go out here and if I run Webpack, Webpack generates my JavaScript file. And I show you what that JavaScript file looks like. Nothing special. There's a whole bunch of Webpack crap in here. Uh, but it's bringing SignalR in, it's bringing my code, it's bringing in the SignalR dependencies that are needed. Um, this package includes just the specific things that I need for my client-side application to run. And that is really daunting code to read, isn't it? Because you don't actually have, no one actually reads this file. <laughs> All right, let's hit, let's hit run. Because I want to show you what happens underneath the scenes. Let me hit my... All right, let me do a zoom here. All right. I have a couple comments in... Ah, come on, mouse. In the console. They're like uh, Connection Hub Builder. That does a couple things. It normalizes the URL, so I told it just slash chat hub, but it says, well, if you're looking at localhost, 63.245, I know what the full URL should be. It takes care of that part for you. If you're running SignalR on a different server, or a different domain, then or a different origin, than what you're running, um, you're loading the web page from, you can do cross-origin uh, work with SignalR. It's one or two con configuration um, options. But you could set up as your URL, not just slash chat hub, it could be a fully qualified domain name and it will still connect. Then when I said dot start, the, the next line happens. We set up a, a negotiation with the server. Now I'm running Windows 10 and I'm running the latest version of Chrome. It's pretty obvious I'm going to use WebSockets. Let me give you another, another scenario though. What if I'm running IE9, which is supported? IE9 does not support WebSockets. So I have i9 talking to the latest, greatest version of IIS with uh, .NET Core behind it. Well, they're going to talk and they're going to decide, well, I would love to talk web WebSockets, but i9, you don't know how to talk WebSockets. What can you talk? They'll probably fall back to Forever Frame, which is uh, a much more complicated protocol, but it works with older IE. Uh, the worst case scenario is it falls back to long polling. A long polling. You don't want long polling. <laughs> what long polling does is uh, who's done jQuery AJAX requests? All right. Really? No one else? I, I figured everyone's done it, but it's like a rite of passage. All right. You make an AJAX request up to the server with long polling. It makes that AJAX request and never closes the connection. The connection stays open until the server has something to send back down to the client. So it's the server gets this notification. Uh, let's send the method, write message. The open um, Ajax connection gets that message, returns it to the client, closes the connection, and reopens it again. The worst case scenario is that connection will close after two minutes because that is the default timeout for most modern browsers. If an Ajax request is open for more than two minutes, it will automatically sever the connection. But that's okay, because we're using SignalR. SignalR, in, in its implementation of log polling, knows that's gonna happen, automatically reestablishes the connection, and everything's great. Uh, the key is, from a user standpoint, they should not know the difference. Everything should work the exact same way for the client, or for the user, as though I'm running, if I'm running WebSockets or if I'm running long polling. The third piece is the hub protocol, and that's essentially the language that the client and the server are going to speak. They're talking over WebSockets, but what language do they use? 
JSON is the default. Everything serializes to JSON almost, and then you can deserialize from JSON. But there are other languages we can talk that are a little bit more efficient. That I'll show you at the end, depending on where we are with time. So they know how they're talking over WebSockets, and they know what language they're speaking, which are two very important things. When that happens, I'm connected, I'm good to go. If I go to my network tab, we'll see I have a WebSocket that's open. Uh, to my chat hub, every connection gets a unique ID, and this ID will change if I refresh the page or reconnect back to the server. Uh, uh, switching protocols, if this remains open, I, these are just um, heartbeats. So I'm getting heartbeat data from, from SignalR. They're keeping the connection alive. All right, but this doesn't do anything. Let's go make it do something. All right, let's close that. Let's go back into our FTS. All right, step one, if I press the button, excuse me, if I press the button, let's go get the message, which I already did, that's value, and let's send that uh, via SignalR. So I already have an open connection. I'm going to invoke a method on the server called, if you remember, broadcast message. And I'm going to pass in value. All right, SignalR, go execute or invoke the method, broadcast message on the server, pass it the parameter value, whatever it is. All right, that's one way. Well, the next way was, or the next thing was, this gets executed. So when our turns around, we tell it, tell all the clients to please execute their write message method, giving, just passing the parameter through. So if I go back to AppTS, I have to create a, an event handler. So on my connection, yeah, I know that's hard to see, I'm sorry about that. I have an on. This follows, uh, this just follows a standard. On the method, uh, I'm sorry, on the event write message, we're going to execute an event handler. And sorry, there's a bunch of code in here. So I want to go get my element for messages. I remember messages is my unordered list uh, that I'm going to put stuff in. Then I want to create a list item. So we'll say document, create elements, uh, a list item. Then on my list item I'm going to append a child which is a text node. So much effort just to create one little piece of HTML without using jQuery. Then we'll append the list item to our messages and that should put something in the list. Yay. All right, let me break that up a little bit. All right. Assuming, assuming I did everything correctly, if I run Webpack again, rebuilds my page. All right, no errors, that's good. Let's go back and rerun this. All right, my page loads. Let's make sure everything connected. It did. All right, I'm gonna come and say, hello world. All right. I hit my breakpoint on the server. I know it's hard to tell, so I'll kind of zoom in here. But it says, hello world, there's stuff in there. I'm now gonna return the message to all the clients. I have something in the list box. Don't clap yet. It's usually funnier with a larger audience. All right, let's put this stuff side by side. All right, I have Hello World over here. Let's come over here and say, uh, Microsoft Maniacs, hit send. It goes to both same time and I'll do that rapidly over and over again all right now if I had four browsers if I had a hundred browsers or a thousand or ten thousand they would all get the same message because they're all connected to the same server they're all getting the same thing yay all right and that's when everyone applauds and they throw roses and 
You don't have, don't, no, 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 you, you are better than that. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so that's a very basic SignalR application. Uh, there's, it gets a lot more complicated, but it's not worth getting more complicated until you've done it for a while. So let's talk about what's different um, with what I wrote, with what you would have written in older SignalR. Uh, the first thing is the JavaScript client. I said before, there's no jQuery dependency. This was one of the biggest issues with the older Signal R, was that you had to have jQuery. And at the time, in 2013, that wasn't a big deal because every project had jQuery in it, in some way, shape, or form. But eventually, as web applications matured and web application frameworks matured, our requirement for jQuery kind of faded away it wasn't the first thing you put into your application starting from scratch. It became like the fifth or sixth thing. Well, SignalR still depended on it, and I have a couple applications that use jQuery specifically because I use SignalR. I can't get away from it. Uh, well, that's not a problem anymore. It's all written in TypeScript from the ground up. Brand new client. It installs via NPM. That's kind of the way the industry's gone for JavaScript applications. You install from NPM or from Yarn, and then you uh, inject it as modules into your, into your code. Uh, still cross-platform, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari, and Opera, all supported, including uh, older IEs, uh, 11, 10, and 9. Although, I have not actually been able to get it to run on 11, 10, or 9, because you have to do some really weird um, uh, compiling, JavaScript compiling <clears throat> in order to get to run on older versions of JavaScript. So it's more me being lazy, but yeah. Anyone support 11, 10, or 9 still? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we have a new clause in our contract that say we will only support IE 11 as the oldest browser. And most people are okay with that. Um, next are the, is support for binary protocols. So in SignalR, we'll call it one, the, the older version of SignalR, the only way we could communicate was by JSON. You noticed a minute ago when I said hub protocol, it said JSON. And I said there were other languages it could speak. Well, there's a, a protocol called message pack, which allows, it's like JSON, but it's binary JSON, which is not, not like binary JSON, like Bison, if you've done MongoDB development. Uh, it's, they have a web page. Let me go find it real fast. Um, uh, where is it? There it is. It's like JSON, but fast and small. This is a really dumb example, but if you have JSON, compact is equal to true, schema is equal to zero. If you were to compress that with message pack or send it with message pack, it would compress like this. Um, a mapping, a string, a mapping, a string. Well, instead of 27 bytes, it's 18 bytes. All right, not a huge, not a huge difference. Um, this is now supported with Signal R and it's fairly easy to implement. If I go in here, well, let's do a very quick test. Let's run this again. The best part about Chrome is it'll tell you uh, the size of payloads. So if I go to the network tab, um, let me refresh to get my WebSocket. So if I send a very large, we'll say hello world, okay? I have two messages. I have my message out and then the message in. Uh, 86 bytes and 63 bytes. So let's make a mental note of those. So we'll say before uh, 86, 63, okay. And it's using JSON. Let's close that. Uh, I'm gonna go into my startup CS. I'm gonna go to NuGet. And I'm going to install the message pack protocol. Sorry, that's hard to see. Uh, for ASP. for single R for ASP.NET Core. It's a very quick install. All right. Fix 
accept. All right, if that's done, then in my startup, all I have to do is tell it, it should add message pack protocol to SignalR. And just to make sure I'm not crazy, I don't, all right, I don't have to add it anywhere else. Then over here, this is in my TypeScript and my, my JavaScript file. Let me make sure my notes are right. I'm going to import, uh, we'll call it message pack from ASP.NET signal R protocol message pack. Uh, I already have this installed, so I'm not going to go install again, but you npm install that package. And then down here on my hub connection builder, everything's fine. I want to add another option here that says with hub protocol and say new message pack message pack protocol. And that's open close. Let's run Webpack one more time. All right, those are just a couple warnings. I'm not worried about those. All right, no errors. So if there's no errors, everything's fine. All right, let's, uh, let's shoot back over here. Let's hit F5. Let's run the project again. All right, so two lines of code. Let's uh, refresh here. Notice I have a new hub protocol. We're talking message pack. I said connection.start. The client and the server negotiated that WebSockets is the best way for them to talk, uh, best pipe for them to talk over. But then they negotiated. The client said, hey, I would like to use message pack. Can we talk message pack? And because I had told the server message pack used message pack protocol it said yes let's talk message pack protocol what if i forgot to tell the server to use message pack protocol it would automatically revert back to json because that's the common protocol they both support yeah let's uh let's type our all right let me get my my chat up here now i'm using binary frame so i'm not going to be able to see my raw text anymore but if I say hello world and hit send, all right, I had one up and then one down. One was 36, one was 31. So after was 36 and 31. I'm not a math wizard, that's almost half. Well, that's a, that's, that's a little over half going up and about half coming back down. That's a good savings. If you're sending decent payloads, which I do in several of my applications, 50% is pretty good. Let's, let's try to save as much of that. Uh, I am getting ready to, I was going to do it today, but didn't uh, have the gall to do it. Um, I was going to implement this in one of my client projects where we are sending regular messages every couple seconds that are fairly large. And I want to see what type of savings we get by putting message pack uh, into place. And um, I'm expecting, if I'm getting 50% on 60, uh, 86 uh, bytes, I mean, I should be able to get much better savings with larger payloads. With just, what, two lines of code. All right. Uh, each hub gets its own connection. So I had a hub connection builder talking to the chat hub. That's, that makes a ton of sense if you have done old signal r in old signal r i could still have multiple hubs but they all use the same connection which is bad if that one connection dies for any reason um, in signal r for so asp.net core because each hub gets its own connection if one of those connection dies for any reason uh, that's okay it doesn't affect the other hubs and the other connections it also gives us a case where I could, if I wanted to, take all this stuff. Create copies of it. All right, so this one's kind of useless. Let's, uh, uh, actually, no, that might work too. Okay, 
So I have connection two, connection two, connection two, connection, connection, connection. Let's do a quick run. Oh, let me build my webpack real fast. So that ran, that's, that's F5. See, I have two connections to both the chat hub. That part doesn't matter. It did two initializations. I have two different IDs altogether because it's two connections. If I say hello world and hit send, I'm going to get two responses because uh, I sent the message up and then the message got broadcast to two connections on this particular client and they both do the exact same thing put a message in the in the list um, on our list so I could do that and that's fantastic uh, one of my larger clients we have six connections going for every one tab at any one time which from a bandwidth standpoint is not a big of a deal um, single R a single process can handle well over a couple million connections um, and you, you really don't run into any issue unless you are limited in some of your uh, memory. If you have limited memory, you might get limited on the number of connections. But generally, it's not a case. Um, and then there are also scalability options that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but the, the big benefit of having each hub with its own connection is specifically around authentication and middleware. I have some hubs that can only be used by administrators or people who are in the administrator role. When I had one connection, I was really trusting ASP.NET identity to make sure that non-administrators couldn't accidentally execute a method on uh, an administrator hub. With Core, I can trust a lot more because I don't even make a connection to that hub. If they're not an administrator, they can't connect to that hub at all. And it doesn't prevent me from making all my other connections to other hubs that don't have restrictions on them. Uh, you could also set it up where some hubs use JSON and some hubs use message pack. You can really customize how your web application is connecting back up to the server. And this is, <laughs> this is a big deal now. Uh, but subscribing to events after a connection starts, it used to be that, so right here, when I say connection on write message, the reason I do that after or before my start is because in the old version of SignalR, you had to set up all your event handlers before you started the connection. And not a big deal, but if that connection quit and you had to go recreate the connection object, you had to go reestablish all those connection handlers all over again. In the new version, they finally made it where I can create these event handlers anytime I want to, before the connection starts or after the connection starts. All right, uh, and then finally scale out. This is the the big this is the big wrap up. Um, and we have a problem when we are running uh, in a production environment. I am. Fairly certain, how many folks run a big production application on a single server? All right, most people don't. Most people run at least two uh, in a load balanced uh, scenario. A lot of people run three, four, 10, 20. I mean, depending on how popular your application is, you're running multiple nodes. Uh, so there's a, there's a fundamental problem with that with SignalR. Well, let's talk about scaling. The application I just showed you, the simple demo, will not scale at all. Let's talk about why. I have two people, me and I, that you and me are on the computer. We both connect to the same website, through the internet, go to a single server that has our application. I send a message, you send a message. I send a message, you send a message. Those messages, I just say, all right, send it to all connected clients. They go back to the cloud, they know everyone who's connected. Well, what happens when my, I get so busy I need to add another server to my load balance set? Well, I connect to the cloud or the load balancer to server A. Uh, Adam over here connects to server B. And sorry, the line's so faint, I'm not sure why. 
Well, if I send my message up, goes up to server A, well, I call clients out all, uh, the syntax is different here, um, I'm reusing slides, but I say, uh, send the message method, send the message, uh, my method, to everyone who's currently connected. Well, who's currently connected to that server? Just one, just Kevin. Poor Adam over here is not. He's connected to server B. He, so server A does not know that Adam's over there on server B. It's not gonna send the message to Adam. So the message goes right back to, to where I am. Yeah. No. All right, how do we fix that? All right, so our servers, they connect individually to another service that we call a backplane. And the backplane is responsible for uh, marshalling calls between the different servers. So in this same case, I send a message up through the load balancer, goes to my server, I call clients that all execute my method. Server A sends that to everyone it's connected to, but it also puts it up on the backplane that distributes that message to all the other connected servers. So server B says, okay, I'll send this to all my clients as well, which includes Adam over here. All right. And it just repeats itself over and over again. So whether this is two servers or it's a thousand servers, as long as they connect to the same backplane, they should be able to broadcast messages across all the different servers. Now, the big fundamental change, sorry, is in Signal R1, your backplane could be a variety of technologies. Most commonly, Redis server and Azure Service Bus. These were the fastest, most efficient ways to uh, set up a backplane. SQL Server was also supported because some people whined, but no one in production used SQL Server for a backplane because it was too slow. There was no physical way that all these servers could uh, pull a SQL Server quickly. Uh, it's just <laughs> physics. Uh, so most of us used Redis or uh, Azure Service Bus. And SignalR for ASP.NET Core, they made a couple small changes. Uh, first, they only supported Redis uh, for scale out, which makes a ton of sense. They did mostly out of time and mostly because that was the most popular option uh, with old SignalR. So that's all they supported. Uh, there's also an issue with load balancers, and they put a condition in here that you have to support sticky sessions, uh, which has more to do with the, uh, the way connections are handled. Um, I don't know the technical explanation for it, but if you don't know what a sticky session is, sticky session says that when my machine connects to the load balancer, the load balancer marks my connections so that every other connection I make through the load balancer will always go to the same server. Uh, and that's useful because in a load balanced environment, when you're talking to a backplane, these, uh, when you're talking to a backplane, uh, my connections and my messages are being sent are coded a very specific way on the backplane uh, that if I was jumping servers, so one message comes into server A, but then the next message goes into server B or into server X, it doesn't matter. If those connections kept changing, uh, it's, it could throw off signal R and they haven't built the support for that yet. Uh, so that's why they say use sticky sessions if you're gonna use a backplane. Um, that's what I do in my production. I don't have any problems with it. Uh, the only problem you typically have is what if that server crashes or is removed from the load balance set? Well, that also, what we do is we invalidate the entire session and just make you re-log in because you're on a different server. Um, th but there's another thing that just came out, um, brand spanking new, is the Azure SignalR service. And the Azure SignalR service which I have running over here somewhere. Um, uh, you don't have to run everything in Azure to use it, but 
This is, and that is, I'm sorry just for the contrast issues. It's, I'm gonna bump it up a little bit more. All right. Um, the Azure SignalR service is a backplane up in Azure. It's SignalR server. And what we can do is we can tell our applications that instead of connecting SignalR back to my server, let's connect to Azure, use their backplane, and Azure will connect back to my application and Marshall calls uh, back to my application. Uh, what that does is it doesn't matter how many servers are in my load balance set, all the connections are going to Azure. They're only going to one, one endpoint in Azure and Azure's marshalling those to uh, different parts of my application uh, that can support it. It's really easy to set up. It's harder to un understand. Let me go get a key real fast. Is this in GA, general availability? General availability, yes. Uh, wait, no, no, well, it's preview. I think it's preview with the GA license, so, um, or a go live license, which is not exactly the same thing. Uh, so, so GA means we fully support it, we're going to fully bill you for it. Preview with a go live means we will bill you at a slightly lower rate and we, we, we support it. Um, but they don't have like a 99.99. I don't think they have the five nines yet. Um, so there's also, so there's two things you can pay for. There's, do you have one server uh, or can you have up to 10 servers? Uh, I just use free for demos. I can have a hundred connections to, to this one service, which is fine for demos. Um, even in our con, um, client uh, applications, uh, probably, like two nodes is probably good enough for us. Um, what's really hard is you really don't know how many WebSocket connections you have at any one time. So it's a hard thing to, to, to determine until you just put it out in production and see how many people connect. Um, there's also a limit on the number of messages per day per unit. Two million is actually, actually seems pretty low for a uh, busier application. And also SSL support. But twenty twenty five dollars starting. And that's just for one node. Uh, all right. So I got that. Let me set this up real fast. This is only a server side change. So if I come in here and I say, uh, let's see. Let me remember what it's called. Oh, it's already in there. But if I go to startup, instead of use signal R, I'm gonna comment that out. I'm gonna say app use Azure signal R. Uh, that takes a configure. Oh, oh that's right, I'm missing that. So then, uh, all right, so configure. I'm using configure here, but configure is the same as builder. Let me just copy that. That's better. It's the exact same call. Just use Azure Signal R instead of use Signal R. And up here at the top, I'll take my connection string. And I lost it because I copied over it. Let's grab the connection string. And let's see. Add Azure Signal R. I'll pass that connection string into it. Clean up my code real fast. Let's hit F5. Nothing needs to be done on the server or on the client. Sorry. So what happens is when I initially connect to my server for Chat Hub, it's going to tell me nope. Connect our WebSocket through negotiation to my SignalR service. It passes all this information up to it. So uh, remember, I have two connections, both talking message pack. I'm going to come over here, set my breakpoint again. 
say hello, hit send. I hit my breakpoint. My breakpoint has hello in it. It's going to rebroadcast it out. But the messaging went through Azure. So the um, pressing send, message goes up to Azure. Azure sends it to my service, which is currently on my local machine. My local machine sends a response back through Azure back to uh, this client. And if I had hundreds of clients, they would all be connecting through the same endpoint. Uh, I don't think this registers anything soon enough. Um, if I gave this a little bit of time, you would start seeing the marks. Uh, oh, Kevin, Kevin had two connections. He sent two messages. Um, so it's, yeah. Let's see if I can get to refresh. Yeah, it'll take it a couple minutes to refresh before it actually shows something. Um, but this is really handy tool. Uh, when it comes out of preview, I think it will be, that's when I'll use it in my uh, client projects. But this is really handy if you are running multiple servers in a load balance set. You don't want to worry about manipulating um, or hosting the backplane. Because like right now we host a Redis, uh, we have a Redis server that we use for our backplane. Works fine. But if I could use uh, Azure to go our service, it would do the exact same thing and it works better because they're optimizing that workflow specifically for SignalR. Where Redis is a um, key value store first, it's a dictionary database, which is not the most efficient way for uh, SignalR to communicate. SignalR works through it efficiently and quickly, but it's not the best way. SignalR service is written specifically for SignalR, so it's the most efficient way possible for multiple nodes in your load balance set. Um, what I'd like to have is a developer version that I can run locally or host on my own um, that does the same thing, but I don't think that's, that's in the near future. But, uh, excuse me, but the SQL yeah. server. Yep. So now, what is the problem we have with the SQL server? All right. So uh, the problem with SQL Server is that, um, let me go back to my slide. Uh, why is it? All right. The problem with SQL Server is not writing to the backplane. So this is, if that backplane is SQL Server, inserting rows into a table, that's what it's doing, putting rows in a table and saying, uh, server A posted this message. The, the issue comes from all the other servers that are continuously pulling that um, that server for new updates and looking for updates that are reasonable. Just this act of uh, reads and writes to, um, to SQL Server over and over and over again by multiple servers, that puts, it's not bad from a SQL Server standpoint if we're just looking at what SQL Server is doing, even a highly optimized SQL Server. But comparing that to the real-time aspect that I need from Signal R, and but if I'm comparing the same interaction between SQL Server and Redis, we're, we're talking night and day. Redis is all in memory. It's not doing anything on disk. So it's, uh, hey, the value of A is B, and it stores that. So if I go back later and say, what's the value of A? It's, it's B. Uh, SQL Server has to go create the execution plan if it doesn't exist or it needs to go run the execution plan you're probably adding three four times the latency we're talking double digit milliseconds latency oh. uh, to go do a lookup in the table to return a result where i'm probably going to get the same result all the time anyway compare that to one millisecond if not less latency that i get from redis because redis everything's in memory um, there are also more tightly defined queries. Uh, Redis doesn't have an execution plan because you're asking it specifically for one thing and there's only one place it can go to get that answer. Uh, where SQL Server is, well, it's in this table. I have a plan over here that tells me how to get it from that table in the most efficient way possible. Uh, but if I have a busy uh, backplane, that table or the tables that it puts everything into might have hundreds or thousands of rows in it, and every little bit of data I put in there that needs to go to all these different servers, that just, it adds time and can really, if it's not slow, it's gonna bog down that SQL server. And if you're using that SQL server for anything else, 
um, that's just going to slow down the rest of your application because you're if you just ping a SQL server over and over and over and over and over again, it's not going to respond to the critical queries as as quickly. Now that's why we tell most people don't use SQL Server other than development, uh, because you will notice it as soon as it go, goes in production, and two people start using the server. <laughs> um, the alternative is you could have a different SQL Server specifically for SQL R, which there's a way around it. Um, It'll be working. Having a separate lesson for specifically for our signal R. Yeah. That, that might be. So then only signal R slow? Is there a way I can change the polling frequency or this? My, my yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. need it immediately. Yeah. Then within a minute or so, it's fine for me. In that case, is that okay? That, uh, so we're talking old signal R, and I think that was an option um, when you. SQL Server is not even supported with Core, so it's not it's not even a discussion there. Yeah. But in old Signal R, I believe you could set the interval. And so the option about the Redis server on the SQL Server and Redis a Geo Signal R. Service. Yeah. So these are the three options, or do, do we have any other? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Redis, uh, Redis, or Azure um, SQL or Azure Signal R service. Those are and only two and options. And, and, and in case if you're planning to go on, if we if push Redis, how much memory do we feel it may go and consume in a Redis? Because again, it, it's, oh, it's, yeah. five, it's a memory base. Not that much. Um, I have my, my largest client where we have about six connections per tab. Mm. Uh, so at any one time, they probably have maybe a thousand to fifteen hundred connections open. It's not a busy, busy site, but it's busier than most. Um, we, and we use Redis for other things. We only take up maybe a hundred meg of our Redis server. Um, and co connections are fairly consistent across the board. Um, yeah, it, so I'm running a one gigabyte, the, the cheapest Redis server you can run in Azure, and I'm nowhere near the threshold on it. Works well enough. And other thing, basically, uh, I know. So we mentioned it's basically the request or web socket, which is a little bit different than actually requested. And at one point, I heard that that your connection one hub can take a millions of connections. Yeah. And I think as far as web sockets are there, do you see any of the issues when large number of web sockets are open for a server or, or any constraint like that? I've seen web sockets up over a million connections. Um, they actually have a tool, the ASP.NET team, that will open as many connections as it possibly can. And on low-end hardware, they were able to open over a million connections uh -huh. um, on one server. So, because you're, you're mostly limited by, uh, by memory. How many connections can it physically store in memory? Um, and they, they optimize. The ASP.NET team of today is all about performance and and hardware efficiency. How can they get as many connections in as quickly as possible? And they'll they over optimize. No such thing. They over optimize every aspect of ASP.NET to um, to make it as efficient as possible. Um, the the PM, the project manager for uh, Signal R, is um, I don't know if he's PM. David Fowler is his name. Great guy. Really smart. That's all he lives and breathes every day is how can I make ASP.NET as efficient as possible? Uh, and he's one of the reasons why um, ASP.NET is now more performant than uh, Node.js in several situations and Go in several situations where before .NET wasn't even, the, wasn't even an option on most people's radar. Now they're kicking butt on all the benchmarks. And um, so, so yeah, from a performance standpoint, it's one of those when you hit the wall, you're probably hitting the wall in other aspects of your application first. Um, you're probably hitting connections with API endpoints or other MVC endpoints before you're hitting a, a wall with uh, Signal R. I think uh, other than basically the backlink and, and and having a .NET Core, if there's any other extra dependency or uh, 
installation or any other requirement on a, on a server side? No, no. Uh, so from the server side, the, the biggest requirement is if you want to support WebSockets, you have to run at least IIS 7.5 it's 7 or 7. Point, I think it's 7.5. That was the first version of it, uh, IIS to support WebSockets. Uh, so on a development machine, that's Windows 8 or higher. On a server, that's Windows Server 2012 or higher. Um, so uh, all the Azure stuff supports it fully. On the client side, you're you're fine for every um, every user, every version of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge out there in, in the wild uh, that people are actually using. Uh, you're not supported, you're supported on IE 11 with WebSockets and IE 10. IE 9 does not support WebSockets. Um, How about Edge? Edge, that is, that is Edge yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure basically, so when you mentioned that WebSocket is there in, support is there in IS 7.5 yeah. and how about a Kestrel? And, and I'm now I'm, oh, so, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, so if, so specifically if you're running behind, uh, if you're running Kestrel by itself, hmm. or you, so Kestrel is the open source web server for, for ASP.NET, which means if I was running this on a Linux machine mm -hmm. under Kestrel mm -hmm. and there was no IIS in the equation, mm -hmm. it runs fine it, because it supports WebSockets out of the box. Okay. Uh, okay. Specifically, if I'm running Kestrel behind IIS, mm -hmm. an older version of IIS, and there's no pass-through for the WebSocket. Mm -hmm. So the WebSocket connection doesn't actually make it to Kestrel. It gets cut off at IIS. Um, but if you have a newer version of IS, you have WebSockets turned on on IS, which you have to go turn on. It's a is an option in the configuration, mm -hmm. um, and then Kestrel supports it. It passes through no problem. So that's actually a good point. If you're running, because everything in ASP.NET Core is cross-platform, uh, your if you're on Windows, you should run behind IS. Uh, Kestrel is not a battle-hardened web server. It's good. It has all the features you need for a web server, but it's not battle hardened yet. So they still recommend you run behind IIS. If you're on Linux, run behind Apache or um, uh, uh, Nginx or Happy, not Happy. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the name of the load balancer. Express? What's that? Express? The, the means tag? Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've lost it. Uh, Engine, Nginx is the most popular one on Linux, uh, other than Apache. Uh, but running behind something else that's a little bit more battle-hardened, just because you, you want that layer of security between your, your web application. Let it handle all the dirty work for you. Um, but their recommendation, Kestrel is getting really good. And they're, I'm starting to see their recommendation change where you could just run Kestrel straight by itself. Um, a good example is in Docker. So if you're running in a Docker container, mm -hmm. a lot of the Docker containers that run ASP.NET are just running Kestrel. There's nothing. There's nothing in between. Yeah. Um, okay. Which isn't a big deal. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Since we're talking about Docker, this scenario of Signal R and having a serve the uh, Signal R server run on a server. How about is it? Is there? Is there? Uh, is there any advantage to put on Kubernetes and just scaling out horizontally that way? Uh, I'm not going to exactly say advantage. I think it's easier from an orchestration standpoint to run it on um, Kubernetes or Swarm. Um, this, to, and it depends on how fluent, fluid you need your interface to be, or I'm sorry, your uh, your environment to be. I am not. I'm not. I know enough Docker. <laughs> In Kubernetes to be dangerous, but not enough to be uh, useful. <laughs> so uh, that, that's a that's a good way of putting it. Um, so, well, my key point was, would you know of any reason not to do like that? No, no reason not to, because they you're essentially sending up multiple little machines that um, they're running in their cluster. They might be running uh, across 
multiple servers in a data center, they might be running hybrid cloud. You, it's just a different way of doing the exact same thing that we've done with, uh, say, virtual servers in, in the past or, um, or even physical machines a long, long time ago. Or this is, the, it's the same way as me going into Azure App Services and just moving the dial of how many nodes I want running. Uh, it's, they all, all basically does the same thing, just a little bit differently. Um, and, but from a SignalR standpoint, exactly the same. So as long as they can talk to the backplane, which they should be able to, um, you should be cool. And, 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 and uh, the main thing for, so setting up a backplane in case of a ready. So you, you just showed one example in which we set it up for a uh, Azure um, mm -hmm. How is it? Is it trivial? Is it, is it, is it too much of a thing over there? So if I was going to use Redis instead, uh, I think that's a different package. I don't remember. Yeah. So there's a Redis package right here. Um, okay. ASP.NET Core is in the Lord, uh, Redis. Uh, you know, and then, and then the client will have a endpoint over Redis. Yep, yep. So it will automatically, because it's a server, that's a server issue. The server will automatically connect to Redis server. Um, you can tell it which channel in Redis to use. Uh, I'm not sorry, not channel. Um, which database number to use. Um, you can set all those options. Because I like to go uh, on our production machine, I'll sometimes peek into the Redis server just to see what's happening. And we have it on its own its own database uh, database number. Mm -hmm. I, there's so much I have to learn about Redis still, but it's in its own number, so we can go look and see what's happening. And it's usually it's not doing anything because the messages come and go so quickly that we can barely see them going through the system. All right, I'll give you. Just for sake of time, keep asking questions. I'll show you one real-world example of a SignalR server. I think that, that is the only main thing. I think in, in, in sometimes we, we sort of try to go and use uh, SignalR, but most of the time, with all the load balancers, you get into a little bit of a this nits. Now, sometimes you have a load balancer, but you don't have a Redis. Yeah, yeah. But then, then you are pretty much back into a, uh, oh, you, you can't move it. Yeah. All right, so this is an application I wrote a very long time ago. This is a, one of my nonprofit clients. This is using an old version of SignalR. Um, let me find something. All right, so I'll just leave this here. Uh, this is an application called LiveCAD. Uh, so specifically in, this is uh, Southern Ohio, and um, an organization called the National Institute of Public Safety Technology they support this application that uh, aggregates data from various 911 agencies in all these various counties of, of Ohio. And what they do is they broadcast this information back out to different firehouses. Uh, because in Southern Ohio, they have a problem where uh, counties, counties are so large and they only have so many firehouses or emergency um, um, services that if I'm in County A and there's an emergency in County B it might be more efficient or quicker for me to respond for it to it than County B would be the response to it so maybe it's right on the border uh, so what they do is they build up uh, these configurations of these are counties and zones that I care about and if I see an emergency come in on these channels uh, that I can respond to them if I have the resources to respond to it. Uh, so what ended up happening is I got a call from the National Institute of Public Safety Technology and they said, Kevin, we have this client, or we have this uh, product, LiveCAD, and it does this thing, and it's really killing our hardware because they need this to be real-time. It has to be real-time because it's 911 data, not, and that's really uh, the thing to be in real-time. And I, I go in, and I do, a, I do a review and they're using old ASP.NET web forms. And this page is inside of an update panel. If you remember your web forms and updates every second. <laughs> so every second across thousands of connections, going back to the server and service hitting the database where the database is building out the view. Not just getting back data, it's determining what color 
all these different things should be on the page based off of database logic. And <laughs> I'm looking, and this thing is pegging out at 100% CPU. Memory is off the hook because SQL Server is on the same box as the web server. I said, of course, it's, you're killing the machine <laughs> because it's doing way too much when nothing's happening. Uh, notice there's been nothing, nothing's updated on this page since I've connected. All right, so I come in, I rewrite the entire thing using uh, the latest version of ASP.NET NBC. We connect some more in the back end for real time, um, uh, real time support. We, we get everything looking as close to the original as we could. Everything tested, we were happy. We put it on production and people start hitting it and we see the traffic coming in, but I'm looking at the CPU and the memory and CPU is just flatlined. Like it's not doing anything to the point I thought it was broken. <laughs> but all of a sudden, we start seeing stuff popping up on the screen. The statuses are updating, uh, we're getting a, uh, incidents coming in, and stuff is happening in the page. It's just that we just took all the load off a of SQL Server, which also was running on another box at this time, and we were doing all these updates, like all the rendering is being done on the client, where it should be done. We're just passing data back and forth. This doesn't get data unless the server determines that it needs to get data. We, we filter it um, very aggressively. The kicker for me was uh, about five months after this went into production, we did some bug fixes. I got a call from the, the lead guy at NIPST and he said um, one of the firehouses reported they were, they were sitting around the firehouse and a call came in that said uh, someone was having um, a stroke or breathing difficulties or it was a heart attack or something really severe. Something that they needed to respond to. So uh, the guy saw it come up on the screen. Um, when emergency comes in that they need to worry about, this screen flashes red, um, which thankfully is not happening right now. But, uh, so the guys were getting suited up. They got in the truck and the, the door is going up, the truck is rolling out of the firehouse when all of a sudden the dispatcher comes over the loudspeaker and says, there's an emergency, blah, 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 you need to respond to it as soon as possible. And we're talking like 60 seconds, 60, 90 seconds of time had already come and gone from when they saw the notification on the screen to getting to it up to getting in the truck and the truck going out the door. And um, I don't know if anyone has ever had a family member or someone they know who has suffered from something like a stroke or a heart attack where seconds can mean the difference between life and death. So to the point where just with some basic technology and a couple lines of code and doing some robust filtering, we were able to put out software that responds in real time and ultimately is saving lives because the people who depend on this data is getting this data as quickly as they possibly can. So. Uh, I, I will submit sessions to different places that say how I save lives <laughs> with SignalR, and that's because that's, that's exactly what we did here. Um, so this is a real use case that has been in production for years um, and still does its job perfectly. If I go look at the console, there's, yeah, I, I left all the stuff in there. We didn't take any of that out. But um, we have different cases that we listen for and so I'll get stuff from the server that says, hey, change the status, uh, status of one of these trucks. And uh, notice I'm not getting very much because nothing's really happening right here. But every, we have probably 100 different configurations. They all get their own set of messages. Um, specifically because in SignalR, we tell them, so say there's, so there's a truck M132. Uh, in, in our backend, that's a unique identifier. Uh, yeah, thankfully enough. Let's see, uh, resource updated, okay. So E132 is a unique identifier in the backend. If, um, when we set a configuration, when this page loads, it tells the server, I care about whatever happens to E132. But 10 other configurations might say the exact same thing. And if something happens to E132, we're only sending it to a group of people, which might be 10 connections, or it could be zero connections. Maybe nothing goes out at all. But we really uh, narrow who gets what information, and it's all accurate. We're not pinging the server. 
Um, yeah, works great. So that's my, my feel good. And that's running WebSockets. Uh, but we also have people that run, uh, some, um, some of the firehouses run this on internet connected TVs. And those don't support WebSockets, but they connect long polling. So it's, it, but it just works. So, all right. All right, well, that's all I have for you all tonight. I will stick around and answer any questions you all have. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.